Welcome back to Nine Hole Reviews. Today we discuss the modern Royal Hong Kong Police. The British colonial police force with a unique mix of uniforms and small arms that lay witness to the colony's development. And the Royal Hong Kong Police was indeed branded with the uniquely colonial Burmese green summer uniforms with their Sam Brown belts, which became a symbol of trust to the locals, especially during the last year of the colony's existence. With the best American and German police small arms of the era, and with units formed by and trained under the British Army, the SAS and the SBS. How exactly did this police force, with mostly Chinese faces, wearing British uniforms, carrying American firearms, secure decades of an impeccable reputation as the finest police force in the East? While the story of the Royal Hong Kong Police started with the British gaining control of the colony after the Opium War, the modern day Royal Hong Kong Police really took shape in the 1960s. And indeed during the 1960s, they wore those press green uniforms with shorts and Webley revolvers and British Army weapons. The force also bore a closer organizational resemblance to the British Army with its companies and platoons rather than the American police precincts. And in this uniform, the Royal Hong Kong Police got into gunfights with the Chinese PLA and communist militias on the borders in the late 60s. But it was the 70s when the anti-corruption reforms had transformed the Royal Hong Kong Police into the basis of a disciplined force and when the weapons were overhauled. And despite Hong Kong's strictly disarmed society, this was the era with a major uptick in organized crime. And as a major seaport, Hong Kong had an influx of weapons being smuggled through. Elite units like the Special Duty Unit or SDU were formed under the guidance and training of the British SAS and the SBS. Crime waves in the 80s pushed the Royal Hong Kong Police into modern police tactics to fight off daring robberies and gunfights in the dense cityscape. Elite units in Hong Kong continue to cross train with Tier 1 Western units such as the SAS, the GSG-9, the US Navy SEALs, and major US police SWAT units. And so we arrive in the mid-90s, where the Royal Hong Kong Police emerged as the most capable police force in Asia, with one of the most interesting mixes of equipment. The police constables and the foot patrol units were educated and spoke both English and Cantonese. A traffic unit that operated like clockwork, the Police Tactical Unit, or PTU, in their blue berets to handle emergencies, manpower surges, and riots. A Marine Police Branch that was effective at stopping smugglers and protecting the coast. Rural Patrol and Border Patrol officers who continued to bring stability to the frontier or the new territories. The SDU became a pop culture icon of the East in the 90s, fighting international crime gangs, wielding Type 56 Chinese Kalashnikovs, pistols and even grenades. And finally, the Elite Airport Security Unit, or ASU, was further developed as a quick reaction force that specialized in counter-terrorism and aircraft hijacking response. Today, we examine the best representing small arms, the pistols, the service rifles, submachine guns, shotguns, and finally, the special weapons of the Royal Hong Kong Police. Live fire demonstrations are done in the 90s era police tactical unit rural patrol or tactical training uniform with a genuine beret or beret with a crowned badge on the PTU flash over a British DPM jungle uniform. Excerpts from a podcast episode with Royal Hong Kong Police Constable Wong will also bear first-person witness to these weapon systems. In some cases, if they use the uh, Russian type, 
you can just simply fold the grenade into the mailbox. You find the cover, like the stairway or uh, before the handover, the mail post will be a good mm -hmm. cover. But let's get on with it. Now, Hong Kong was and still is generally an unarmed society. The populace never had easy access to weapons, nor was there a deep culture or any rights to arms. Most of Asia does not have a deep culture with civilian arms ownership, despite a very apparent interest in how weapons work. For Hong Kong, revolvers had always been an adequate firearm for local policing, and the British calibre of choice was a 38200, also known as the 38 Smith & Wesson, the shorter 38 calibre. The Webley Mark IV revolvers, the Colt's Police Positive pistols, and the Smith & Wesson Victory Model m and pistols were the most commonly seen carried in a cross-draw holster on the left side of the green uniforms. However, with the crime waves in the 80s, the force traded away its underpowered 38200 cartridge for the American 38 Special, and formally adopted the Smith & Wesson K-Frame Model 10, loaded with 158 grain lead round nose or wad cutters. It carried on the leather strong side Golden Goodrich holster, with a prominent RHKP property stamping on the heel. The Model 10 was a dependable, smooth-performing American service revolver. They have to finish the basic course. The course is like uh, 360 rounds. They got two stages. One is 10 meter and the other 15 meter. So basically, with the 15 meter, they normally you shoot with the barricade, which is the you know common sense. This was the beginning shot, so you see I've got my side picture aligned a little bit too far to the right. But all 222222, reload 222222, all of them in. Acceptable for me. Although the Smith & Wesson was considered adequate for most of the policing in Hong Kong, there were complaints about the six shot limit, even with the issued HKS speed loaders and a desire for a higher load capacity was always there. Especially when constables stared down the Chinese Type 56 Kalashnikov barrel and were told not to employ their service rifles in urban areas. The elite units, under a higher mission risk, followed suit after the British Army and searched for a suitable magazine-fed semi-automatic. And for years, the SDU followed the British SAS's choice, the classic Browning High Power. They packed 13 rounds of 9mm with a dependable steel frame pistol. Certainly a worthy upgrade to the 38 revolver they used in 1977. And later in the 90s, the SDU, the ASU and some plainclothes detectives brought on the pragmatic choice of the Glock 17. Shotguns have always been a versatile and devastating tool for law enforcement, and in the 1960s, the Royal Hong Kong Police was mainly using Greener Martini Action police shotguns. These 12 to 14 bore shotguns were made to only accept proprietary ammunition to prevent unauthorized use. We've actually shot the Greener GP, a related 12 gauge or 12 bore shotgun, on our shotgun range in the Practical Accuracy series. And it's not easy.
which makes way for the most representing shotgun used by the Royal Hong Kong Police. The American Remington 870 12 gauge pump action shotguns. In fact, the brand Remington is so intertwined that the common Cantonese word for shotgun is simply Lo Ming Dun. The brand Remington phonetically translated into Cantonese Lo Ming Dun. Patrol units packed the Remington in their vehicles, and the shotgun was frequently employed during high profile engagements. The shotgun, normally they will let you try like during the police uh, training school and in the PTU or if you're being assigned into your platoon and your position as shotgun, every year uh, you have to uh, finish like 25 rounds of the shotgun for uh, testing and also 5 rounds to hit the uh, PPC target. Yeah, out from the like uh, 15 or sometime uh, with the buckshot, 20 meters. And elite units, such as the SDU or the ASU, employed the Benelli M1 Super 90 semi-auto shotguns and the shortened Remington 870 for breaching purposes. The shotgun, and the Remington 870 to be specific, is a crucial firearm that holds an important role from basic to elite units in the Royal Hong Kong Police. A lot of you are afraid of using your force. But if you're a little bit worried, they're getting too close, it's getting dangerous, and you think your men's lives are in danger, you're quite at liberty to use the shotgun. Now, if you got a tiger, you can't use this one. 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 You can't use this Providing you warm first. The service rifle has always had a place in the Royal Hong Kong Police. From the old days, the Lee Enfield No. 1 and No. 4 harken back to the World War II era of the British defending Hong Kong from the Japanese invasion. And as the RHKP progressed into the 60s, the American M1 carbine was once mass adopted across the force. Although born from military requirements, the M1 carbine was also a favorite carbine for US law enforcement officers of the era. Since it was a reliable 15 round magazine lightweight carbine that shot a cartridge with sufficient energy, accuracy and range for urban police work. However, pushing into the 70s and onwards, the Colt 602, the AR-15, and the M16A1 styled rifles became the new norm for the Royal Hong Kong Police. The lightweight and dependable Colt AR-15 fit the philosophy for a law enforcement rifle and was subsequently seen throughout the Royal Hong Kong Police Service. The elite units also carried the Colt Commando carbines but are rarely seen in images since most sightings were of the SDU responding to urban events with MP5s and shotguns. Any type of drill and ceremony event for the Royal Hong Kong Police was an interesting observation on the force's lineage. The uniforms, the drill and ceremony of the officers are distinctly British, and the Lee Enfield was at one point featured heavily in ceremonies. But in the 90s, the RHKP would actually march with their American AR-15s with M7 bayonets affixed. Now, the British variant of the FNFAL, or the L1A1 SLR, and the later the L85A1 or SA80, had most certainly made appearances in Hong Kong in the hands of the British Army, the Royal Marines and the Gurkha regiments, but they were never officially adopted by the Royal Hong Kong Police. Now there have recently been some poorly conceived notions that these rifles were surplus US military M16A1s and subsequently M16A2 rifles. This is very, very wrong. Remember that the Royal Hong Kong Police in the 80s and onwards was very well funded and rarely received surplus rifles. If one were to look closely at the images, 
These were generally early generation rifles with no auto sear pin and lacks what we call magazine release fencing, uses a simple A1 rear sight system and many even have the old style three prong flesh hider. Clearly, these are an early production AR-15 rifle with new M16A2 furniture installed. With a military background of the Royal Hong Kong Police, the submachine gun has been a close quarters weapon of choice. And in the 40s, officers were armed with a Sten gun. But later in the 50s and the 60s, the Sterling submachine gun took an increasingly important role in the Royal Hong Kong Police. The side magazine fed British direct blowback submachine gun proved to be dependable, reliable, and widely used in the Marine Police units, and is actually still used well into the 2000s. The Royal Hong Kong Police was an early widespread adopter of the MP5. Initially, it was only the elite SDU with its SAS origins that used the MP5 family. The MP5 was used amongst most land units, both elite and regular. Police constables and police tactical unit officers had fixed stock semi-auto only MP5A2s that were stowed away in their patrol vehicles. For decades, the SDU employed the classic MP5 techniques with the stocks collapsed and a three-point sling outstretched in tight CQB environments. But they oftentimes favored a slick top iron sight based MP5A3 with a surefire combination, as classic 90s SAS operators would for general purpose. And of course, the MP5 SD for special purposes, or the MP5K with no stock for breaches and pointment, as the SAS operators would. The MP5 proved itself to be a versatile and useful tool in the Hong Kong cityscape that gave officers more firepower to counter criminals, but was also extremely low on recoil and easy to train new officers on. Okay, so uh, what I did right here, I used some classic SAS uh, engagement techniques with the MP5. Uh, slick iron sights, and with the classic H&K three-point sling, you'll see my first shot, I did a uh, sling, com sling uh, tension uh, with the stock compressed inwards, so I would, was not using the stock outwards. Looking through the sights, I was, first two shots, very tight, but low. So I was able to then adjust it higher, very effective two shots very effective two shots. And then once this was over, I clacked the hostage target. Again, still with sling tension and no, no stock extended. But once I finished that, and I pressed over here, you can see I extended the stock and then made more precise hits on a target that was smaller and then progressively smaller and smaller. So as an urban tool, the MP5 is a very, very effective uh, weapon system. In the 60s Hong Kong, there were major communist riots following the Cultural Revolution in mainland China. The Royal Hong Kong Police had to majorly ramp up its anti-riot capacity, as IEDs, petrol bombs, and communist kill squads were formed to assassinate their opposition. While British soldiers wielded the L1A1 and Hong Kong police officers wearing shorts wielded the M1 carbine with batons and wicker shields, the 37mm multi-purpose launchers were frequently used. The British Webley No. 2 Mark I pistol launchers and the American Federal Laboratory's 37mm launchers were frequently seen. In some of the units, like EU, emergency unit, they got uh, tear gas they got tear gas gun, grenade launcher. Grenade launcher, not for grenade. It's uh, from the wooden uh, uh, wooden pallet, you know, 
to hit the cow when uh. when it's out of the wild you know they just hit the ground and try to you know uh, you know grab the crown to be dismissed if they come at you two seconds far either you go back to the police station or you go to the mortuary what do you want to do Marksman's rifles were mainly used by the elite units in Hong Kong, the ASU and the SDU. SDU snipers started with hunting type rifles and scoped AR-15s in the 70s, but quickly progressed to the G3 SG-1. Um, as you can see here, this is a G3 SG-1 that is outfitted with a, a Hinsoul, um, a varial power optic, it's got a bipod, it's got a cheek riser here on the rear stock, and it's got a very unique uh, trigger group. As, as with most organizations, they were using bolt-action rifles, which did not have speed in follow-up shots. Um, so they were looking for something more capable, um, but not in uh, the full uh, potential of a dedicated sniper rifle like what would become the PSG-1, something a little more cost-effective. The G3 SG-1 would later be replaced by the venerable PSG-1 and the British Accuracy International AW family of rifles. The extreme accuracy of the Accuracy International systems were vital for pinpoint shots during hostage rescues. As the clock struck at midnight, on the 1st of July 1997, the Chinese People's Liberation Army crossed the Hong Kong border. The British crown on the officer's cap badge was replaced with a Bauhina flower with five small stars on it. And the Royal Hong Kong Police officially turned into the Hong Kong Police Force. In 2005, the green colonial uniform with Sam Brown belts would be phased out and during the flag raising ceremony on establishment day in 2021, the Hong Kong police color guard would goose step out for the first time while posting colors. And soon after, the PLA would send trainers to the Hong Kong Police Academy to train all new graduates with a PLA style of saluting and goose stepping as the new standard. As time goes on, certainly more of the Royal Hong Kong Police colonial past will erode. But for now, despite the goose-stepping and the restructuring, the officers still march with the American AR-15. They still carry the Smith & Wesson revolvers. The elites still use the German MP5. And their field rural uniforms are still in British DPM. And the old Royal Hong Kong Police bagpipers still perform at ceremonies and memorial services for their aging comrades. Ladies and gents, so you've made it to the very end of the episode. You're either genuinely interested in the topic or you're a supporter slash subscriber. Either ways... Thank you for your support and thank you for your attention. Now, on that note, uh, it was the patrons and the Utreon supporters who suggested that instead of revolving around a firearm and talking about the organizations that used it, maybe we could revolve the episode around an organization and talk about the firearms that they use because there is a correlation there that is also interesting. And of course, this particular episode was incredibly nostalgic to me, so I could not resist. But I'd like to seek your feedback in hearing what you think about the episode itself. Now on the episode caveats, um, I'd say one of the big things with an episode that encompasses so many different firearms is that on the accuracy, there may be some things about the firearms that we demonstrated that are not 100% what you call clone correct. Obviously, the Smith & Wesson Model 10 that we used is a genuine Royal Hong Kong Police marked Model 10, so this is a genuine item. But then, although the Webley 38, Special, or 38 Smith & Wesson that we used is 
a British issued Webley. It was not issued in Hong Kong, so it does not have the actual stamps to it, but it still functions the same. And then we've got the shotguns that were used and the AR-15 that were used. Functionality, no real differences, but the AR-15 that we use is a full A1, which is different from the 602 pattern that the Royal Hong Kong Police used, and different enough to say that there are differences. And the same thing with the shotguns. There's the extended mag tube, the side saddle, but I expect or I hope that you are enlightened enough to understand that it is a good depiction of what the Royal Hong Kong Police used. And then also, there are items that do have a functional change, like this Sterling submachine gun. It is not a submachine gun because it does not go automatic. It does not select fire. But it's still a good depiction of what the Royal Hong Kong Police used, right? So, again, you know, there are certain things that you just take it with a pinch of salt. Um, on this note, it's actually uh, very nostalgic to me because this is the Sterling was the first firearm I'd ever handled. Um, and I... Thanks to the RAF trooper at Shekong Airfield who allowed a young boy on a field trip to look at what a Sterling was like and feel the heft of it. I digress. I think when we're looking at episodes like this, episodes that revolve around an organization, yes, we have the genuine items. Yes, we have the genuine uniform items, which sadly to say the brim is now disintegrated and this is a genuine item, so I destroyed it making this episode. Again, I digress again. Um, episodes like this revolve around an organization. And I think... The people are what are important for episodes like this. And one piece of information that I felt like I could not expand on as much in the episode was a bilingual nature of the Royal Hong Kong Police. Yes, you had Asian faces speaking English. And I don't know how it was, but the last time I visited Hong Kong, they still responded to orders by saying, yes, sir, in English. And back then, you had Britons who would join the Royal Hong Kong Police, and they would all learn Cantonese. They all had to learn Cantonese. Now, some of them had lived in Hong Kong for long enough to where they could speak Cantonese, not exactly like a local, but fluent enough to where you would have everyday conversations with them, no issue. They could read, too. Then you also had your public servants at the very baseline who could keep command and control within the unit. Talk to the NCO, even if the NCO needs to translate things into English every now and then. They still had a baseline level of Cantonese to where they could talk to both locals and some of the uh, officers within their unit to maintain the unit's integrity. Now, yes, that is a classic 90s Hong Kong film, and it's not real, but I think it does a decent job at depicting how some of those British expat officers interacted with their colleagues in the RHKP. This video is not where I compare where the Hong Kong police force is currently and contrast it with the RHKP, but rather I'd like to preserve some of the nostalgia, some of the memories of their professionalism and their spirit of public service and the way they indeed did serve the community of the Hong Kong government and the people of Hong Kong uh, back in the day, especially when I was there. On that note, I invite you to check out the podcast that we did with Officer Wong, who had a few snippets throughout this uh, video. And you'll see that at the end screen and down at the description. For now, I'd like to thank Officer Wong for his contributions, his son Justin, uh, the gun room, Polinar Tactical, James Williamson from Teufelshund Tactical, Ian McCollum from Forgotten Weapons, 
our British friends, Jonathan Ferguson and Mike, or as you know him, Bloke on the Range. And most importantly, all of you out there. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you on the range. Zero nine six, this is Zero nine six, Roger, over. One thing, Zero nine one, one pack, green, green.